Our speaker for today's special junior high school, high school assembly, is Mr. Dean Blakeney. Dean, because of his work with karate and using the karate technique to teach Christian principles, showing young people and adults how to be saved, has been blessed across the country. The ABC uh, television network, through its news media, has advertised through the newspapers and television and radio the abilities of this young man in helping young people and adults alike. Mr. Blakeney has been featured on the What's My Line program, also on the ABC network news program of Howard K. Smith. Mr. Blakeney is a staff evangelist for the Al Janney Evangelistic Association based here in Miami. We're certainly glad to welcome this morning, Mr. Dean Blakeney. Very good to be here this morning. And I'm going to speak to you today on a specific subject that I think you need to know about, dealing with hardness. You know, in our lives, there are all types of hardness. In the Bible, you hear about the hardness of a man's heart. You hear about some teenagers who are hard-headed. You hear about some preachers who are hard-headed. And they mean different things. Today, I have here with me a 150-pound block of ice, which is very hard. And it's, uh, in a moment, I will attempt to break this. I have over here eight inches of concrete, which I'm going to break with my head, blindfolded. And also I have some fruits, some melons and some potatoes, and these also represent something in a teenager's life, because what I'm gonna demonstrate with the samurai sword on the watermelon, I'm gonna sever this from a man's stomach. I will be blindfolded and uh, maybe he will too. Depends on how nervous he gets. Sometimes they, when you get up here, you know, they want to throw their hands up and say, wait, you know. And of course you cut off all the fingers and this is very embarrassing to me and to the person that I do it with and it kind of ruins my ministry. So you'll understand. But we're going to demonstrate them some things today in this relation. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, get a young man up here, somebody in the audience, and I'd like to cut a potato off of their hand with a Gurkha knife. So uh, we have some volunteers. Yes, yes, here's a young man right up here in the front row. Very good. Looks a little nervous, but we're gonna, we're gonna use him. If you'll just kneel right down here in an attitude of prayer, I'll tell you what, let's move out a little bit closer to the edge so they can see. I'm going to use an India Gurkha knife in my demonstration. This, uh, Gurkha knife has many uses, mainly to sever a man's head from his shoulders. This was the basic use of the weapon. And I'm going to demonstrate here if my brother will just kneel right down, right there. Okay, and hold out your hand. Okay, put, put your thumb down. Now we want you to keep your thumb. Important if you're in school to have a thumb to be able to write with. Uh, I have to hold up just a little bit higher there. All right. Easy, easy, a little nervous. It's all right there. Just hold that potato. Turn it this way, just a little bit. Is this your good hand, son? What's your name? John. This is John. Are you saved, John? Yes, sir. John's saved, and that's good. I, I only use saved people for these demonstrations, usually. So, John, you just keep your thumb down. Open your hand up. Open it up. Don't be afraid to open it up. All right. Okay, does John have a girlfriend here? <laughs> you tell her to pray for John. Hold still. All right now? Now he's really shaking. <laughs> Before I was shaking. Hold still now. Close your eyes, John. We'll be over in a minute. Please be quiet when I do this. All right. Thank you, John. Good. Now John will be able to do his homework tonight, and, and I know you two all love homework in school. I, I've, some, how many of you in here are ten, in 10th grade? That was my favorite grade. Look at that. Three years of my life there. It was really great. I enjoyed it very much. 
I had some bad teachers, of course. That's why I stayed there so long. But I'd like now to get another uh, young man up here, and I'd like to demonstrate another technique with the Gurkha knife. Uh, who will volunteer? I think I'll pick one, just like in the Army. This is good. Uh, this young man right here on the end. Blonde hair? Yes, yes. Come on up. All right. Let's get him right down. Right here, brother, right next to the bricks. No, don't, don't hit the bricks. Turn around. This way. That's it. That's it. Okay, kneel down. Put your hands down on the... Hands down. No, no. Hands down on... Oh. That's it. We're going to cut it off your neck. <laughs> he didn't understand, see. He thought he was going to cut it off his hand. We're going to sever this potato from his neck now with the Gurkha knife. Are you all right? Okay, you all pray for him. What's your name? Bob. This is Bob. Everybody know Bob? Yeah. Okay. Is Bob saved? Yeah. <laughs> His head's bumping him down. I don't know if that's yes or I'm just scared, you know. But you all pray for Bob because your neck is very important for, <laughs> for living and breathing and eating and things like this. So, no, don't you look, Bob. You just pray. Bob's in an attitude of prayer now. He's probably closer to the Lord than he's ever been. <laughs> and this is good. We want him to, to be that way. All right. You all just pray for Bob in a second. Second, this will all be over, Bob. <laughs> yes, it will. Won't it, Bob? Mm -hmm. Okay. Be very quiet, please. This, this requires a great deal of self-control, a great deal of practice also. But the key thing is control, to be able to bring the blade through the potato and stop before it gets to the flesh. So you understand, all right? A little bit more. <laughs> I don't want to make a mistake on a man's neck, so you just hold right there. I'll get it this time. That's it. Right through. <laughs> Thank you, man. All right. I would much rather go a little bit short than a little too far. You understand. Now we're going to demonstrate another technique here. I have a couple of things that I want to show you. But I want to take this watermelon in just a minute. And I want to, to cut it from a man's stomach. Now this is a very delicate operation. Uh, I'm not really a doctor. But uh, I use the blade fairly well. And I want to explain to you about this blade. This is a samurai sword, a Japanese weapon. Now, my style of karate is kung fu, which is Chinese. But this is a Japanese weapon and very effective because it's very well balanced and uh, can do a multitude of things with this, mainly <laughs> cut people's heads off, things like that, or watermelons, potatoes, bananas. And I'm going to get a little rag here so when the juice drips, we'll be able to soak up the juice. You understand? But see, the sword is a picture of two things in the Bible. The sword, uh, as far as God is concerned, is a picture of revealing and a picture of judgment. The sword, the Bible says the word of God, is a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the bones and marrow, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your own heart. The word of God can cut right down into your heart and into your life and never leave a scar and remove all of the sin in your life and cut right down through to the very not just your flesh you know I can take this sword uh, and Dag if you'd come on up here we have a volunteer has a nice round stomach and this helps <laughs> in this situation if Dag would come on up here and just lay down on the table here Dag just put put your head here and your feet there that's it we'll let Dag rest just for a minute and I want to explain to you exactly what's going to take place. But remember this thing about the sword. First of all, the swords back in those days would have two edges, one on each side. When a Roman soldier would come down to fight, he would strike across this way, sort of reveal the inside of the man, <laughs> you know, get it started. And then he would sometimes wouldn't have time to turn the blade back. So with the other edge, he would come back across the neck and cause the man to go to sleep very quickly. <laughs> 
but a two-edged blade very quickly striking this way and then coming back across the neck to finish the job. Now, let me explain to you something. Some of you teenagers, you wonder about this thing of salvation and Jesus Christ. The first thing that the Word of God does is sort of when you hear the Word of God, it sort of comes down, God comes down with that first blow and sort of opens you up and reveals the sin in your life. Through the Holy Spirit of God, He opens this up, reveals to you the sin in your life, and then He, he puts you in a crisis situation. Dag's in a crisis situation right now. He doesn't know exactly what's going to happen when this blade comes down. Neither do you. Neither do I. I mean, yes, I know. I know what's going to happen. All right. But Dag is in sort of a crisis situation. He had to make a decision today whether to come to school or not. <laughs> and I was going to use him here. But I'm going to sever this from his stomach. And, and God <laughs> reveals your sin to you. He opens this door, lets you see what you really are. And you know, we're all sinners. We're all lousy sinners, basically. Sort of rotten inside. Have you ever seen a real uh, mellow watermelon? You cut it open, and it's just brown and pulpy. You know, you just don't want to bite into that kind of melon. But on the outside, when you first looked at it, you said, well, man, that looks great. I can't wait to get into it. But see, this is what the, what the Word of God does. He cuts into your heart, sort of opens you up, and lets you see just what you are. And then he gives you an opportunity to either accept his love and his death on the cross and all the blood that he shed for you and for me, or you get the opportunity to reject him. Now, you make up your mind. And so here's, here's the sword, and here's the melon. Here's the revealing part. Just hold on to that pencil. But I give a man, I put a pencil in the end of the melon so the man can hold on to the pencil and keep his elbows back out of the way when I strike. So... Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, just resting there. You okay? You can hold it fine. All right. I'm going to do this uh, blindfolded. So you all pray for me and Dag. And don't pray for the watermelon. It's all right. Okay. Now I'm going to blindfold Dag because I don't want him to jump. So Dag, you just stay right there. Okay? Yeah. That's good. I had an occasion where a man jumped one time and almost cut his hand off and I wouldn't want to do that but keep this in mind the Word of God is sharper you know just like I said when I cut through this melon it's gonna leave a scar there's no doubt about it when that blade comes down it's gonna sever that melon in two or very close to it sometimes I come within an eighth of an inch close very close but I have to stop you know because you don't want to go any farther <laughs> you've got to be careful with your control and it reveals what's inside this melon and I want you to thank your own self as we're doing this. And I want you to pray for me as I do this because it's a very difficult, very dangerous technique. But I've practiced a great deal of time and the Lord has used this to show many young people just what is inside their heart, what is inside their life. So you pray right now for Dag. Dag, I'd like you to take both hands, hold on to the pencil, and move your elbows up in the air. That's it, back this way. You understand what I mean? All right. Now I've got to just get an idea of the melon here. Okay. This is a small melon. Makes it a little more difficult, but Dag, trust me. Don't you, Dag? Yeah. All right. He didn't say that very loud, did he? All right. You all just pray. Remember, keep your elbows back. Okay. Now I'm going to put on the blindfold. Now in Kung Fu... You learn to do many things by your senses. Sense of touch, your hearing. Now I must see with my ears and not my eyes. Many times the Bible relates that many men, they can see physically, but actually they're blind because they can't see the way of salvation. Right now, physically, I am blind. But spiritually, I hope that you will realize that Jesus Christ is the only answer for your life. If one of the men would tell me if I'm in the center of the melon. Am I in the center, Mr. Hart? Yeah. Okay. It's very... Okay, you got your elbows back. Okay, you all just pray very quietly. When I give a key, I'll just tense up a little bit, okay? You hear a key, I just tense up. Okay. 
I have to tense my body and prepare myself so that the adrenaline in my blood flows just to the right point and I know exactly when to strike. Praise the Lord, that's over. I know Dag is glad that's over. Okay. Now as we look into that melon, we see it looks pretty good. Might give that to the principal after it's over. Somebody if they want it. Only costs $2.80 in this winter time. It's hard to get these melons. But that reveals something. And I wonder what if God did this to you spiritually, as he's doing right now in your own mind, what would be revealed in your own heart? Would it be beautiful like this melon or would there be a lot of sin? A lot of things that, saved or unsaved, are going to cost you much heartache and much trouble if you don't turn to Christ and follow Him. Now, I'm going to demonstrate another technique now. I'm going to demonstrate breaking eight inches of concrete with my head. And I want you if, you, if you happen to have a Bible with you, to turn to Proverbs. Proverbs, the 28th chapter, verse 14. And this will be the main crux of our, dis our discussion this morning, what I want to talk to you about. It says, Happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Here we see this thing of hardness again. Now, how does a man you know, harden his heart? You know, it's soft, it's pliable, it pumps blood. How does that become, you know, how can you say a heart, if it became hard, you couldn't, you couldn't live? But this is a different illustration. God is trying to make a point here of rebellion, of rejection. And I want to go on a little bit farther. I want you to look over in chapter 29. Just cross the page there. The first verse. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You know, if you go back to that other verse, he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief, it also could mean fall into hell and be destroyed utterly. Think about this, because it might apply to you today, young person. It might apply to any one of you. You may be rejecting, and one day, all of a sudden, the hand of God is going to come down and strike, and it's going to be all over. And I want to, to demonstrate a couple of things here. I have this 150-pound block of ice have this eight inches of concrete. And we're going to demonstrate a little bit of the power of karate. I think right now that block of ice is awful hard. That ice has cost me much many times. So I want you to pray that we can do both of these. I'm going to do this blindfolded. I'm getting over the concrete now. I want to make sure I'm in the middle when I strike this. I want to make sure that I know exactly where I'm striking, what I'm doing here. 
You strike with the head, this is very dangerous. If I made a mistake here, it could cause a concussion, possibly death. Again, I'm doing this blindfolded using what we in Kung Fu or in, in Karate call sixth sense, knowing just where to strike and how to strike these blocks. I'm not getting angry. I want to relay this when I breathe heavy like this. It's not because I'm angry, but because I'm getting the adrenaline in my blood flowing. Prepare to break. I remember a story as a young boy that I was told about in English literature of a man named Ethan Bran. And this, this man, as a young boy of 18, was searching for the greatest sin that could, be, that could be committed. He had heard of a preacher. A preacher came through their town one time preaching tremendous sermons and had spoken of the greatest sin that could ever be committed. And Ethan Bran never did hear, never did find out what that was. And he heard about salvation. He heard about God's love. But this thing of the, the greatest sin plagued him. He never did at that time find Christ as his Savior. And he began to ask different people in the town. He began to search and hunger for that great sin that was, that was so terrible. Yet he could not find it. At the age of 18, he left his home. He worked with his father at a brick kiln. Uh, this was a very large thing and, and would heat, heat up very hot. And they would glaze bricks and use these for different works and different things. And so he left his home, he got tired of this, and he started searching. There was a, a vacuum, an emptiness. Many of you here today may have this emptiness in your heart and in your soul. And so he left and he started making his way across the country. He would go by foot, he would ride horseback if he could hitch a ride on a, on a cart or whatever, and work at odd jobs and constantly uh, be looking for this thing. Possibly looking for a man that could tell him what this great sin was. This sin that would separate him from eternal life, separate him from God. Yet he could not find it. And so he, he got into trouble. He got in with a group of men, a group of uh, boys his age, and uh, they got into to stealing things. And they were pretty lucky for a while. They didn't get caught. After a little while, they got into a, a job, an armed robbery job, and uh, they held up a store. It just so happened that the clerk of the store became very excited and upset and started to run. One of the men turned and fired his gun four times in the man's back, of course, killing the man almost instantly. Uh, Ethan Brand himself was outside and was not involved in the actual robbery. And so the men were captured and they were taken to prison. A couple of the men were going to serve 50 years for armed robbery. The man, of course, that committed the murder itself, he was, he was uh, going to have to give his life. They were going to take his life in the gas chamber. And Ethan Brand, he was, as he was in jail, he spent approximately a year this time in prison and still this, this emptiness, this searching. And yet he kept getting into trouble and he couldn't understand it. And he asked the one man, the leader that had killed this man, shot him four times in the back. He said, tell me, Bill. He said, what would you consider to be the greatest sin that, be, that could be committed? And Bill looked at him, he says, the only thing I can can see that would be the greatest sin, as far as I'm concerned, is the murdering of this man. I'm gonna, they're, gonna have, they're gonna take my life in a, in a week or so. And as far as I can see, this would be the greatest sin that could be committed to take another man's life because it's gonna cost me mine. And so after a year, Ethan Bram was able to get out of jail. He was able to leave. He went on, uh, continued to search. He, he felt that the, what this man had said was interesting and important, but it wasn't the true fact. This was not the greatest sin, even though this man would die for what he had done. He went on and uh, he made his way across the country and he, he decided that uh, he would get on a riverboat 
And he, he worked on a riverboat for a while. He ran into to gamblers. He ran into to women of the streets, harlots, prostitutes. He ran into all types. He listened to all of their sins and all of their things that they'd done. And he'd ask these questions. And uh, uh, one of these women that he ran into said, I'm a woman of the streets. I've done everything that you can do. I've defiled and I've wrecked and ruined my life. I, I believe what I have done to my own body and to my own self is the greatest sin that a person could ever commit. My life was wrecked. My home was destroyed. My husband, because of what I did, ended up a drunkard. My, my children ended up uh, 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 killing and stealing and, and doing all of these things because of the sins that I have committed. And to me, this is the greatest sin that could ever be committed. Ethan Brand wrote these things down in a log. He kept a diary. And yet, uh, he continued to search because the answer was not there. The answer was not there. And so he went and he got on a ship and he went across, uh, made his way on this ship across the Atlantic Ocean. And he ended up in Germany. On the way over, he met a, a number of men. And, and uh, these men were hard, cold men, men that would, would kill you for, for a dollar or 50 cents, whatever they would be paid. It made no difference. Life was cheap to them. And uh, he met these men. He saw the hardness in their life. He listened many times as they would gather around an oil lamp at night and tell stories of how men had died, how men had been uh, fed to the sharks for things they had done wrong, and some of the heinous crimes that these men had committed. And he listened very intently to what they said. But to still, he could not find this great sin that he was searching. The one that would separate him eternally from his God or from God. So he went on. He met a Jewish man in Germany. This man lived on the outskirts of town. He was an old man, bent over. And uh, there seemed to be a real bitterness in his life. He asked this man, he said, what do you consider to be the greatest sin? The little old man looked up with his beady eyes in his face. And he says, I'll tell you what the greatest sin is. He says, the greatest sin is when Hitler and Mussolini took my people and put them in ovens and burned them alive. They would take the children, and the, the women and children, and burn them in these ovens. Then he said they would tell them they were going to have a shower, and they would take them to the shower stalls, put them inside and lock the doors, and poison gas would come from the spouts. Men would claw their fingernails right down to the bone, trying to escape the poison gas. They would take them and push them out in bulldozers and bury them in holes. This is the greatest sin. What greater sin could there be than this? And the Ethan Brand listened very intently. He said also they would take some of the men who had tattoos on their body and skin them alive and take the, the skin and the tattoos and make lampshades out of them, the wives of the German soldiers. He says, you tell me what is a greater sin than that. There can be no greater sin. Ethan Brand listened. And finally, he went back to his homeland. He had searched and his face was worn with lines of age and hardness, almost as hard as this 150-pound block of ice that I'm about to break. And you could see it in his face. He made his way back home. And one evening, as the sun was setting, you could see the fire glowing in the distance. Ethan Bram was coming over the hill and down into the, to the place where the, the brick kiln was. And there was a young boy there now. His father was dead and gone. Young boy and an old drunkard in the shack. This was his father. The young boy was playing with a dog. He saw this man walk down the road, come up to the brick kiln. The fire was very hot now. Looked into the kiln. He was staring steadfastly into the fire. As the boy watched, he could not believe his eyes. The man stood up on the edge of the kiln, put his hands over his face, and said, Oh, God! And he leaped, and he dove into that fire. The sparks rose up all around him. The little boy, scared to death, covered his eyes and ran back to his father. He shook his dad. He said, Father, wake up. There's a man that just dove headfirst into the fire. The father, being a drunkard, could not understand this. He, he couldn't even uh, comprehend. He was too drunk. The next morning, he told his father what had happened. They crawled out to the kiln and looked inside. Here it was all white with ash, and in the very center of it, you could see the bones of this man. But in the very center of his chest, there was a hard white thing. He didn't know what it was. He said, son, get me the hook. He went in and got the hook, hooked it around the man's rib, and they pulled the man's body over to the edge of the kiln. He looked inside and reached in. It was very hot yet, reached in with a rag and pulled out this hard thing that was in the center of the man's chest. All the bones were there, but here was this hard thing. He looked at it, and he gasped because this thing was in the exact shape of a man's heart, the exact, exact shape of a man's heart. This man had found the greatest sin that ever could be committed, but it was too late, because the greatest sin, young person, that could ever be committed is that of hardening your heart against Jesus Christ, rejecting him as your personal savior. And just as some of you have rejected Christ today, you are much like this block of ice that I'm now going to break. And as I prepare to break this, I want you to watch this ice because one day the devil 
is going to strike you, or the hand of judgment, God's hand of judgment, is going to strike and break you forever. You'll never be able to know Christ unless you accept him while you're alive. If you do not accept him as personal savior, you'll be broken like this block of ice, and you will be put into a lake of fire for eternity. There's no hope for you unless you accept Jesus Christ as personal savior. I want you to pray now as I prepare to break this ice. This is very difficult, but I want you to watch because it's your life. You may be like Ethan Brand. You may harden your heart just as Ethan Brand did. And I pray not. I pray that today you'll come and find Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Think about this now as we prepare to break this ice. every head bowed, every eye closed. You may be seated for just a moment. We certainly want to thank Mr. Blakeney for being with us today. <laughs> Let's show him our, our gratitude by a rousing hand of applause. Will you, Mr. Blakeney? <laughs>